Hey, turn in your Bibles to the book of Esther. Let me, let me ask you a question. How many have ever studied through, verse by verse, the book of Esther? What? We got a bunch of new people here because uh, we've been through it a couple times in the 27 years I've been here. Um, how, how many have gone through the book of Ruth with us? You, you all should raise your hand because we just did it. Yeah, so... You know, these are the two books of the Bible that bear a woman's name, Ruth and Esther. So I just thought we'd take them as a pair. I know they're not in the chronology in that kind of an order, but both of them have a great message, as you're going to see. We're going to try to get through the first two chapters. So turn there to Esther, put your finger on chapter 1, verse 1, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And, you know, Esther is one of those very interesting books. Um, the message that is in the book is just profound. And Lord, help us as we go through these chapters and through these verses, Lord, as we dig out those nuggets, Lord. And, and Lord, as the Holy Spirit reveals to us the things, the truths that are hidden therein, Lord, may you give permanency to those things as we apply them to our lives. And that we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids would say, amen. If you're a note taker, this would be a good time to get your pen and pen out because we're going to give you the introduction to the book tonight. I'm going to try to work our way through um, the first two chapters. It's written in a different style, as we're going to see. Um, it's the last book. Esther is the last book of the historical books of the Bible. Now, many of you may know, and some of you may not know, that the Bible is broken down into different categories of books. The first five books of the Bible is what we call the Pentateuch. It means five. That's where we get Pentagon from. It's the first five books of the Bible, and it's considered the law written by Moses. Then we have the historical books, and they take in from Joshua to Esther. Those are the historical books that give us history of the nation of Israel, the struggles they went through, how God delivered them. It, it, so it, it, it's written as a narrative, and so you can move pretty quickly through it and grab the points out of it as we move through. And then after that are the poetic books. And that takes us from the book of Job. How many have read Job? Man, that's the book. <laughs> and then through the Song of Solomon. And that's one of the books I will not teach in public. I, I've taught it to the men, um, blushingly so. I taught it one time years ago to the whole audience. And it's just too... <laughs> Uh, you can't teach it the way it's, because if you bring it out, it's just too embarrassing. So, but those are the poetic books. And, and then you have the major prophets, which are from Isaiah to Daniel. You have the minor prophets, which are Hosea to Micah. And that concludes the Old Testament. So there, it's divided up in the sections. And then when you get to the New Testament, you have the Gospels, you have the Epistles, you have the book of Revelation. So it's divided up. But Esther is the last of the historical books that just kind of follows this pattern of giving us the background and history, how God protected his people, Israel, during very difficult times. And so it's a historical book. Just so you know, and inquiring minds sometimes want to know, there's 5,633 words, and we're going to look at every one of them. There's 10 chapters. We'll try to take a couple a week. Um, but it's just interesting because... When you study the book of Esther, God is not mentioned. Prophecy is not mentioned. Um, the word is not mentioned. In fact, is referring to something else or to a prophet. It's an interesting book in that those things aren't on the surface, but hidden within it, there are four places uh, where the name of Jehovah, you, you can decode it, is in there. And there's a reason for even the style, the, the, the acrostic style of those four names mentioned hidden in kind of code, as it were, because the reason for that is, and, and as the Holy Spirit set pen to paper for this, the reason for that is, is that the whole theme of the book, the whole theme of the book is God working behind the scenes. Uh, the idea of the theme of the book is the providence of God. And how many have ever wondered, God, where are you at? Um, Lord, if I can't see you, I can't sense you, I can't feel you, 
Uh, it seems like you're silent in my life. And yet this is the book that will describe to us in the clearest way that although you don't see God in the four, because he doesn't come to the four in this book, you don't see his name mentioned, you don't see prayer mentioned, you don't see references to the word, you don't see you know, mentioning prophets, you don't see any of these things on the surface. But just under the surface, God is working, and we're going to see in such a mighty way that he preserves the life of Israel. In fact, one of the great sayings you've probably heard from Esther is, for such a time as this, Mordecai will say to his cousin, whom her parents have died, her name is Esther, we'll see who the players are in a few moments, for such a time as this were you born. God is working behind the scene. And so, the encouragement of this book, the main encouragement of this book, the main theme of this book is the providence of God. Listen, even though you don't sense him or see him, even though you don't feel him, he's always at work in your life in a way to preserve you, to protect you, to get you from the place he needs you to be to the place he wants you to be. And as though he's working behind the scenes. And that's just the theme of the book, the providence of God. It's interesting that the time of this book is about 483, and we can get really precise because it's connected to a lot of historical events that we can put dates to. So about 483 B.C., and let me give you the characters that are going to come to the fore in this book. They're very interesting, and this evening as we look at it, some of you are going to have that aha moment of the time in history where this has taken place. You know, one of the beautiful things for me is, is that I was in secular college before I got saved, a setting to be a world history teacher, a high school world history teacher, and I'm a history buff. Then I get saved, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And so I take a time off. I take a, a semester off, and, and, I, I just, and I just did not feel like, I just didn't have the desire, I didn't have the leading to go back to secular college. And it upset my father, it upset my mom, and some other people got upset with me, but I was trying to figure out, okay, what do I do now? Because... Listen, my whole worldview changed. You know, I, I'm no longer living for the things of this life. I'm living for the things that are yet to come. And so what should I do? And I was invited by one of the ladies who kind of took us stray cats in. You know, us kids that were getting saved, us young hippies. And she would invite us home and give us meals. So she taught a fifth and sixth grade Sunday school class. And she asked me to be her helper. And I didn't know what those kids knew. So I thought, well, you know, you, listen, education is something nobody can ever take from you. So after I'd gotten my AA degree, I, I just went and transferred it over to a Bible college to get my BA degree. And I'm going to tell you, the time I spent studying history, how it makes the Bible come alive. And then I found out one time, I was just praying about it, Lord, I just love history. He says, well, you're still teaching his story. So you're still a history teacher. I love teachers. We got one in our midst. I pray for teachers. Listen, you couldn't read tonight if it wasn't for a teacher. Somebody taught us. And so, listen, this book is very interesting because it will connect dots for you in history that will blow your mind. Because you remember Daniel, when he had that vision of, of that, that statue there on the plains of Shinar, he said there was a head of gold and then there was a breastplate you know, the, the arms, the, the chest, and the arms of silver. There was the thigh and the, and the stomach of brass, and then the legs of iron. Well, he's speaking of four kingdoms that will come and go. The first of those kingdoms, the Babylonians, have gone, and now the Medo Persians are in place because we're going to see this evening that we're talking about the king of Medo Persia. And then we're at a time where it's giving away now, and what is coming to the fore is the Grecian Empire, which will be followed by. The Roman Empire. So very important historical document as we're looking here. And if you want to place it somewhere else in the Bible, this particular event, which takes over a 12-year period of time, actually, there's a, it's, it's quite lengthy what takes place in this book in these 10 chapters. But it's somewhere between the 6th and 7th chapter of, of Ezra's where this is taking place. So you can put it in the chronology of another book. Anyway, here are the characters. Let's just look at the background. A king, Ahasuerus. You can put beside that Xerxes. Um, how many have studied about the 300 Spartans? 
Thermopylae, the great battle of Thermopylae where the 300 Spartans as Xerxes was bringing his army of a million to destroy and to defeat the Grecians as they were raising to the fore to bring them under his dominion. This is Xerxes. Asherus is Xerxes. We're going to see in a few moments that, well, let me give you some context to it. His great-grandfather was Cyrus the Great who conquered the Babylonians. His father is Darius I who lost the battle at Marathon. How many of you know the Battle of Marathon? Do you know that the, the, the marathon that we run, the race, 27 miles, comes from that as, they were, as the runner came back from the battle to report um, you know, back to the leadership that they had won the battle there at Marathon. Well, his father lost that battle. And the scene in the first chapter is that Xerxes is going to gather all the princes of Noman because they are planning the battle. They're going to go back and fight against those Greeks. And so this is the Xerxes of what we read about in the, in the history about the Spartans that came out to meet them there Thermopylae, and, and the Spartans actually drove them back for a period of time. And then they were overwhelmed. But later it rallied the whole Grecian Empire to stand up against the Medo-Persians. And again, they overthrew the Medo-Persians, as prophecy says in Daniel. Then we come to the next of those parts of the statue, which is a Grecian, and then they were overthrown by the Romans. And so, very important. So, the first one we're going to be introduced to this evening is King Ahasuerus, which is Xerxes, then Queen Vashti. And this is very important. There's no record in history of a Queen Vashti, and some scholars believe that it's actually a title. But it's the wife of Xerxes, and, I, and very, very honorable woman, as we're going to see tonight. Uh, ladies, you're going to be very encouraged as we look at this lady, um, and you know, she just, she kind of slips into history and slips out. And what she's known for is saying no to immorality. Hey, ladies, can you say no to immorality? And she becomes an example to us for us to say no to the things that are not right, no matter what it costs us, because it's going to cost her dearly. She is put before us in this narrative as one who comes in in the first chapter and is gone by chapter 2. But what God speaks through her to you and I tonight is that we need to learn to say no to the things that are, that are wrong, no matter what it costs us. Artaxerxes is the greatest ruler and has the most, as we're going to see tonight, the greatest empire in world history. He, his rule encompassed more land and more property than any other emperor in the history of the world. And yet this woman, his wife, says no to him when, she's going to, when he's going to ask her to do something that's immoral. It's going to cost her everything. But because she said no, listen carefully. You're going to see it. It's hard for me to get ahead of the storyline because it's so profound. It's so pithy. If she had not said no, there would be no Esther. If there was no Esther, there wouldn't be Mordecai saying to you, for such a time as this, you get to go in and rescue the nation of Israel. Had there not been an Esther, Haman would have had his way. And if Haman would have had his way, there would be no Israel today. One woman says no. One woman says, I won't compromise. And it changes the history of the world. I wonder how many times we've said yes to things we shouldn't say yes to. And it's run us aground. I wonder how many times we've said no to things we should say no to. And it's changed the history of people around us. I wonder if Daniel would or not have said no to the king's meat and the king's wine, but stay true to the Lord. I wonder what would have happened to the Babylonian kingdom. We know through the, through the example of Daniel, we know for a fact that Nebuchadnezzar comes to faith. In fact, he makes a decree that if you don't serve the God of Daniel, I'm going to cut you into pieces and make your house a dunghill. That's a great motivation to get saved. What would have happened on the... Plains of Shinar, when that image that Daniel interprets is, is erected, and, and, and then, you know, Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody bow to it. 
because he makes it all of gold, which would represent him. And as the musicians begin to play, on the, they're on that whole plane of Shinar, everybody's bowing. But there's three guys, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, so we're not bowing. I wonder how that affected others. In fact, you know the story. They were brought in before the king, and the king said, maybe you didn't understand the, the, the edict. We're going to give it to you again. We're going to bring some musicians in. We're going to play the song, and you're going to bow. And if you don't, then we're going to throw you in the furnace. And they said, it doesn't matter. Throw us in the furnace. Either God will deliver us or he won't, but we're not bowing. The king became so enraged that he heated the furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. In fact, the soldiers that threw Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego into the furnace perished because of the heat getting close enough to the door. And then Nebuchadnezzar looks inside of this furnace, and he doesn't see three men burning, three men bound and burning. He sees four men loose, and the fire is not even lighting upon them. And they walk out of that flame, and he said, and the fourth was like the Son of God, because three men refused to compromise. They said no to what the king has. I wonder about Peter and John when they were called before the Sanhedrin. And they were commanded to no longer preach in the name of Jesus. And they said, no, you judge. You judge what is right. Should we obey God or you? But as for us, we're going to obey the Lord. They were beaten for it. But they said no to an unrighteous demand. I think of Paul. How many times was Paul put in danger and just wouldn't compromise. We have 14 of the New Testament letters because we have a man who wouldn't compromise. In fact, I personally believe as you study through the Bible that we're not going to get to two chapters. It just dawned on me. This is the introduction. Okay, first one. Always the introduction. There's a lot to it. But we have 14 of the New Testament letters written by Paul and there wouldn't even have been a missionary experience the gospel going out to the world if it wasn't for Paul. And when you study through the New Testament, it becomes very clear, had it not been for the Apostle Paul standing on the gospel of grace the way he did, that, that Christianity would have become another sect of Judaism. You, you would have been circ being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses. It would have got caught up in all of that. And Paul said, not for a moment. I'm going up to Jerusalem to those who think there's someone, and I'm going to, listen, we're not, not for a moment are we going to stand for this. No. You are saved by grace through faith, period. And he stood. And you know it cost him everything to stand. And so as we look at this lady, this queen, Vasti, she's noted for one message, and it's a great one. Learn to say no to the things that are wrong. To compromise. And if you do that, you have no idea how it can change the future. I wonder if some of us tonight are struggling with things, would you say no to those things? How would it change our future? I wonder how many marriages would be saved if men would have said no to alcohol or pornography or adultery or fornication. I wonder how many teenagers' lives would be saved if they say no to drugs and all this stuff that's going on. Listen, no is a good answer to a lot of things. But I want you to see as we paint her tonight, as we look at this, at least chapter 1, she's not rebellious. And ladies, I want to say this to you. If your husband asks you to do something that's not right, you say, you say no. What did she say? Did you hear that? Yeah, 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 Jason, Jason just got the same uh, ex exhortation. No, no, you, you say no. Because you're, you're supposed to submit to your husband as he submits to the Lord. You're following him as he follows the Lord. Paul said, listen, follow me as I follow Christ. If he asks you to do something that's against Scripture, you, you know what you can say? No. Now, you may have to suffer some consequences, but God will bless you. This whole thing that's gone through the church where a woman has to be total submitted to her husband when he's ungodly is absolutely wrong. We're going to see it in the text tonight. But you don't do it in a rebellious way. 
you know, 1 Peter chapter 3 tells us if you be married to a man who's without the word. And the indication in the Greek could be he could be an unbeliever or he could be a believer with bad behavior. He says that by your example, by your godliness, by your chaste conduct, by your gentle and quiet spirit, without a word spoken, you don't need to rebuke him. The Holy Spirit will take care of him. Without a word spoken, listen, you will convict your husband of his sin. Ladies, listen, I've often said this, and I'll say it again. I think it's appropriate tonight to say this because we're not going to get through two chapters. So I'm just going to take my time and take a bite of this at a time. But I've often told you, ladies, listen, the Holy Spirit knows how to deal with your husband. He doesn't need your help. The Holy Spirit didn't go on vacation and leave you in charge. I tell these ladies, listen, if your husband's doing something wrong with a gentle and quiet spirit, say, I can't be involved in that. It violates my conscience and it violates the word. And then get out of the way. Because God has this huge rifle and this magnificent scope. And listen, he never misses. And he's got these giant bullets called conviction. You know, and he knows how to get your husband's head, because that's the hardest part of his body. I'm a man, I know. He knows how to put that bullet conviction right between his eyes. But you know the problem is? When he tries to get your husband across there, all he sees is the back of your head, because you're up in your husband's grill. Get out of his grill. And the Lord will get him. So Vashti. Queen Vashti. So she's one of the characters. And then in chapter 2, we're introduced to Esther. And by the way, there's four years that transpire between chapter 1 and chapter 2. And Esther, listen, her name means morning star. It's one of the titles given to Jesus, our Savior. Because she's going to become the Savior of all of Israel. She's going to take it upon herself to go in before the king when she becomes the queen and intercede for Israel at the risk of her own life because she could have been put to death if it displeased the king. The morning star is the last star in the sky when the night is fading and the day is dawning. And she will certainly be that for Israel. When the darkness is fading and the light is coming, she will be there magnificent woman, a young gal, maybe a teenager like Daniel was, or Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Then there's Mordecai, which is her cousin. And we're going to see as we walk through this, that somehow during the exile, either before the exile or during the exile, during the Babylonians, her parents are killed or they die in that 70 years of exile. So Mordecai, which is actually her cousin, it's her uncle's brother, uh, or uncle's son, takes her to be his own daughter, and he raises her. And, and Mordecai is kind of one of those people that just give you wisdom. He's constantly counseling her, and instructing her, and loving on her, and protecting her. It's almost like he plays the role of the Holy Spirit in this kind of relationship. And then you have Haman. That's the last of the players we're going to see tonight that are going to be in this, as it were, on this stage as this drama unfolds for us. Um, and it's interesting. You know, we're, we're going through Revelation, and we just finished chapter 13, and we got to that end section where it says, He that has wisdom and understanding, let him understand that this man, the Antichrist, uh, he's the number of a man, 666, right? And so, and we know what he's desiring to do is destroy Israel, correct? Well, get this. When we come to chapter 7, verse 6, there's Haman's name recorded, but there he's called Wicked Haman. And when you break down the Hebrew alphabet, guess what the number is for that name, Wicked Haman? 666. So maybe one of the indicators as we're studying Revelation on Sunday mornings is this man will seek to destroy Israel. We know he will. So that might be the indicator is a man who seeks the destruction of God's people will be the Antichrist. So we have Haman. So we have, our, we have Xerxes. We have Queen Vashti. 
We have Esther, we have Mordecai, we have Haman. There's some other players in there, but these are the main players that, are, that have importance for us as we look at these things this evening. So let's just dive right in. Chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of... And I'm going to use the, the name that you will understand because if you go back into the other parts of the Old Testament, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, Darius, Cyrus are the words and names that are used. But uh, Ahasuerus... Um, not so much. This is, this is his name, but he's also the same as Xerxes. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus or Xerxes, this is Ahasuerus which reigned, listen carefully, from India even unto Ethiopia over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. So this man, listen, his empire was over a hundred and twenty-seven provinces. Now, let, let me give you an idea where he reigned, the different countries, so you can put them in your mind today. This would have taken in India, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, all the way down to Ethiopia. This is the largest empire in world history. And this Xerxes ruled over it. Now, let me tell you about Xerxes for a moment. How many saw the movie 300? Listen, he looked like that. Historians of the day tell us that he was head and shoulders above the tallest man in the Persian Empire. And by the way, Persian people tend to be tall. And so he was a giant. He was the strongest man in the Persian Empire. He was also the most vicious man, the most feared man in all of the Persian and Mede Empire. But he was also said that he was a very fair man. Um, he, was, he would reason with you. Uh, we're going to see as we go through the text that, and this is just some other information you need because it will come to play, is that during this time, the Persians, the noblemen and the princes, they wouldn't make any decisions unless they were completely inebriated. In fact, if they weren't completely inebriated and they made a decision, they would say, that doesn't count. Let's get together again tonight and let's just get, you know, ball face drunk and then we'll make decisions. And we're going to see that in a few moments because they're going to make a decision to go to war. Because Xerxes, man, he is furious that his father Darius was defeated at the Battle of Marathon. And now he wants to go and avenge his father. And we know he's going to go to the battle there of Thermopylae where he faces uh, Leonidas and the 300. We're in between those two battles in time-wise. And so what's going to happen in chapter 1? He's going to gather all the princes and noblemen. They're going to come, and for 180 days, for six months, they're going to have a drunken, absolute drunken party. They're going to get fallen down drunk, and then they're going to plan war. And the women are not allowed in this, cause so, so Vastes is going to have her own party for the ladies. But this is how they're going to plan war. Uh, it's interesting that this man one time wanted to go out to war. There was a, one of his noblemen said, listen, we need this battle to be fought over here. And because he oversaw 127 provinces. And one of the noblemen and the princes of a province said, I, I got an enemy on my borders that needs to be taken care of. And so, you know, uh, in fact, this particular nobleman said, I'll pay for the battle. I'll pay for the soldiers. I'll pay for the war if you'll just come down and take care of it. And Xerxes was so impressed. He said, if that guy's willing to pay for the war, I should be willing to pay for the war. He's one of my noblemen. He's one of my princes. So he went ahead and, and fought the battle. And in that particular battle against the enemy of this particular prince or nobleman, one of his sons died. And you're going to see as we go through the text that they had this thing where they chronicled war heroes and they rewarded them and they rewarded their families. And so the family was rewarded because they lost their son. And so now as he's planning this particular war, this man says, listen, the war already cost me one of my sons. This particular battle, I only have one left. And I'm asking you, would you just not allow him to go to war? Would you just spare him? Xerxes took the man and cut him in half. Put one part of his body on one side, one part of his body on the other side, and his army marched between it to battle. So he was certainly a lunatic. So he's the tallest man, head and shoulders taller than any Persian. 
He's the strongest man in this empire of 127 provinces. He is the most feared man because of the things that he does. And the way that he cut this man in two is they had this huge blade and the slide that he slid the man down. And when he hit the blade, he would just peel people in two. Uh, very violent man. Very vile man. I think a lot of demonic activity going on here, no doubt. And so it says here that he was the head of these provinces. Listen, and in those days when King Ahasuerus or Xerxes sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace. Now, he had two palaces. So we know the time of the year this is because Shushan was the winter palace. He had a summer palace as well. And because they didn't have the air conditioning in those days, you, you spent the summers in the cool place and you spent the winters in the warm place. Uh, I think these are the original snowbirds, you know. Uh, you, 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 you head to Arizona in the wintertime to stay warm and you come back up here in the springtime so you can enjoy the beauty. Uh, it was said by one of the historians in Shushan the palace in the summertime, if a snake tried to cross the paved road before he got to the other side, he was fried. So you couldn't be in Shushan in the summertime. Beautiful palace, we're going to see. We're going to get a description of the opulence of this palace. But you couldn't be there in the summertime. So we know that this sometime in the fall or the winter, they're in Shushan, the palace. Um, and listen carefully. In the third year of the reign, that, that's why we know this is 483 B.C. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all the princes and to all of his servants. Uh, and, and listen, of the power of Persia and of Media to the nobles and the princes of the provinces uh, being there before him. And so he invites all of these noblemen because they're going to plan a war. They're planning a battle. And so from all the provinces, all the noblemen, all the generals, all the... In fact, historians tell us between 1,400 and 1,500 men show up for this. And it's a 180-day feast. I wish I would have written down what it took to feed these people one day. It was an incredible amount of food. I mean, it's like 200 sheep and 300 goats. And one of the lists said 400 horses. I guess they ate horse. I don't know. They're talking about ducks and doves and bread. The, the bread was unreal. It was, it was, it was like 4,000 loaves of bread every day to feed these people. And we're going to see this feast last for 180 years. And wine, wine without any, you know, restrictions. Drink as much or as little as you want because you got to get drunk so we can make some war decisions. That, that's the idea here. You know, that, that's why Solomon said, listen, strong drink is not for kings. And, and those who linger long, when it's read before them, are not wise. And so I think being under the influence, I remember back in my BC days, being under the influence, I, <laughs> they can edit this out, but let me tell you something, my BC days. I remember going to Kagers and getting stoned and popping pills and thinking I was the smartest guy on the planet. We would talk about God and the universe and I thought that, man, I am just, I'm waxing so eloquent. I am just so wise. Man, people ought to be in awe of what I have to say. If they would have filmed that, I would have been the dumbest person on the planet. I, I, don't raise your hand. I'll, I'll move on. Some of you have been there too, so don't laugh at me. So he gathers all of these princes from all over the 127 provinces. And, and they're, it, it, the whole idea is to plan this war to plan his retaliation against the defeat of his father there at the Battle of Marathon. He said, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and of the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred fourscore days. This is six months or 180 days he throws this feast. What he's trying to do is impress all of these people of how great this man is, the power, the wealth he has, and how nothing can stand against him. In fact, historians of they tell us that he boasted a million-man army. You know, some of the scholars say, eh, I don't know, because, listen, the population of the planet only reached one billion in, in the 1850s. A, a million-man army was unheard of. 
but he boasted of one. And so he, he, again, his empire is the largest in the world, and so he's gathering this army to go out and fight against the Greeks. So he has all of these princes, these noblemen, all of their generals, all the men of war to come to his party here, and they're going to be there for six months. Listen carefully to verse 5. And when these days were expired, when the 180 days expired, then the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace. So everybody was invited at the end of the 180 days. All the servants, everybody that was in the palace there at Shushan was invited to be a part of this party, both of the great and of the small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now we're going to get a description of the opulence of this court. It says there in verse 6, where were white and green and blue hangings. These are tapestries. You know, in fact, when he, when he conquered, uh, that is when Xerxes' grandfather, Cyrus, conquered Babylon, it, it was said that Cyrus was impressed about the hanging gardens of Babylon. Uh, you know, of course, Nebuchadnezzar had a wife that loved the mountains, and that was on the plain. So they literally built a mountain there. And it's one of the seven wonders of the world, the hanging gardens of Babylon. But historians of the day say, and, they, they, and listen, they have excavated, they have, the archaeologists have, they've discovered the, the site and excavated Shushan, the palace, and they said it would have rivaled easily the hanging gardens of Babylon. This is a beautiful place, and he's going, to, he's going to show off. This is his palace court. This is like his living room. And he's going to tell us that they had these drapes, these, these banners that are hanging. Listen carefully. White and green. See, in those days, you know, you go down to the fabric store, and you say, give me some of that. Give me. Not so easy in those days. Red and purple came from a, a, a kind of a snail kind of a creature from the water, and you would lucky if you got one drop when you squeeze it out. You remember uh, the, the lady in Philippi when Paul gets there. Um, yes, Lydia was a seller of purple. So expensive. But she had a great business going because that was the dye that you used to make the red for the Roman soldiers' robes. Very, very expensive to come by this stuff. Not easy like it is today. So there was white and green and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. Beds were of gold and silver. That word bed would translate for us a couch. In fact, when the Greeks overran the Persians and drove them away, because when they went to battle, they would bring these gold and silver couches. So the couch frame is solid gold. And the Greeks marveled at the opulence of the Medo-Persians. Why, why would you waste all of that resources? Gold and silver couches. Now, of course, the pillows weren't gold. You know, they probably were made of silk and all kinds of, you know, down and, and duck feathers and stuff like that. But the couch frame was gold and silver Upon And that, now he's going to talk about the floor on this particular um, palace uh, area here. The, the, he says that the, it was paved with red and blue and white and black marble. Uh, it, I've seen artist rendition of the Palace of Shushan, and it's something to see. And they gave them drink in vessels. Listen to this. They gave them drink in vessels of gold. The vessels being diverse, one from another, that means they're handmade, and every one of them, there's no duplicate. So you got like 1,500 at least, historians tell us, of these noblemen that came to this party that Xerxes is putting on. This party lasts 180 days, and every cup there, in fact, historians tell us, get this, every cup there was, was unique. Now, if you come to my house... Almost every cup in our cabinet is unique. <laughs> and it's not because we're rich. Some of you have unique plates and mixed and matched because you're the opposite of rich. Uh, you know, I've, got a, I've got a several cups that are my cup, man. And I'm going to tell you, I've got a water cup. I've got, a, I've got one of those uh, mason jars with a handle on it. That's what I drink out of water in the evening. And I've got a certain coffee cup. And nothing matches. 
In fact, if you ever go camping with me in my little camper, I get all my stuff at yard sales, and there's nothing that matches. That's not the situation here. The situation here is this guy is so rich, he has craftsmen making one-off golden cups. Listen carefully, because it gets even better. Diverse from one another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. The idea with this cup is, and historians tell us, that when you got done drinking out of the cup and you set it down, the waiter came and got that cup, took it away, gave you another one, and they melted the gold cup down and made another one. Xerxes is trying to impress these noblemen, these princes, because he wants them to go to war with his million-man army. They're part of that to defeat the Greeks because he's burning, he, very vengeful man, very vengeful man. Uh, he, he's still sore over the fact that his father Darius lost that battle. And so he's trying to impress them. In fact, listen to verse 8. And drinking was according to the law. In those days, they had a law among the Medes and Persians that it doesn't matter if you didn't drink wine or if you did drink wine, it didn't matter. Everyone had to toast the king. You had to take one drink. Well, that law was set aside at this particular festival. So that law was set aside. And what replaced it was, listen, and the drinking according to the law, none did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house, listen carefully, that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Just drink until you're falling down drunk. Because that's when we make decisions. Do you think there's not some demonic influence in this? In fact, our Greek word for, for witchcraft is pharmica. We get pharmacy from it in the English. Because when you're under the influence of a drug, and by the way, alcohol is a drug. Now, I'm not telling you that you can't have a glass of wine with your meal. I wouldn't because of what it's done to our society. I don't. Um, I can't say that that's wrong, but drunkenness is wrong because it allows your mind to be put under the influence of something you do not want your mind put under. I opened enough doors back in my BC days that I'm glad that God shut and I never want to open them again. Because you can open your mind up to influences and to things you don't want your mind opened up to. And I think this was part of their practice. It's like, you know, the Native Indians and the peyote and, and the sweat lodges and all of that. Having these vision and having these animals with your division. Those are demonic. Shamanism is demonic. There's a lot of things that are demonic that we simply don't want our minds opened up to. God wants to protect us from those things. That's why... He tells us what's harmful for us. And listen, God's word is not restrictive, it's protective. And so just whatever you want. And watch verse 9. And Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to the king Ahasuerus, or Xerxes. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was... <laughs> Mary with wine. He has fully he's been drinking for seven days. He commanded. And I'm going to slaughter these names. I know it. But there's seven Chamberlain. If you circle the seven Chamberlain, you'll understand that these are eunuchs. When they would take notable men from other countries that they conquered, they would take some of these very, very wise men and they would make them eunuchs. And the reason they made them eunuchs is so that they, you know, because he has concubines, had his wife. He, he didn't want his bloodline, the king, you know, being interrupted because, you know, one of the guys overseeing some of the kids or women, you know, had his way. And so they would take him and make him eunuchs. These are the men. But, but these were the kind of guys that stood in his council chambers and gave him wisdom. So he, he calls for the commander, Mehuman and Biztha and Harbana. And Bigtha, and Abatha, and Zedar, and Carcass. Drag your carcass in here. The seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Asherah the king. These were consultants. These were counselors. 
You know, when we study through Daniel, you'll realize that he had the Chaldeans there. He had the wise men. And again, the practice in those days, like with Nebuchadnezzar, when you overran a kingdom, you took the wise and you brought them to your to your council. And the same thing here with, with this Xerxes, King Xerxes. He's bringing the wise men. He has these seven men who stand in his chamber to advise him, to give him wisdom. He calls for them. And then he says this in verse 11. Listen carefully. To bring Vashti, the king before uh, the queen before the king with the crown, the royal crown upon her head to show the people and the princes her beauty. For even the Holy Spirit says she was fair to look on. Gorgeous. Historians of the day say her, her, her beauty was not rivaled. Well, at least not rivaled until Esther shows up. The indication here, and we're not sure what it is, but the indication here in, 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 the, in, in the grammatical structure of the Hebrew language is he's asking her to come in and do something that was improper. Now, we're not sure if she was to come in unclothed before all of his drunken friends to see the beauty or just to unveil herself. Because, you know, in those days, you, to unveil yourself was a shameful thing. You only unveiled yourself to your husband. So we're not really sure what he's asking, but what he's asking is inappropriate. The idea in the Hebrew is what he's asking is inappropriate. He's a drunken fool with a bunch of other drunken fools trying to plan a war under the influence of alcohol. They've been at it for seven days. They've been in a drunken stupor for seven days. And in this drunken stupor, trying to impress his friends, he sends his counselors to his wife's chambers and said, I'm demanding that you come and show your beauty to my friends. I like her answer. I like this woman. But Queen Vashti refused to come, unto the, come at the king's command, commandment by his chambermaids. Therefore was the king very wroth. His anger burned in him. This is the guy you don't want to displease. Again, He's head and shoulders above the tallest Medo-Persian. And they tend to be tall. Uh, he could have been as tall as nine feet. He was a massive man. Strongest man in the empire. But had a violent temper. Uh, feared for his violent temper. Feared for his cruelty. They said he could be fair if you didn't cross him. But if you crossed him... He would do things like have your son cut in half. I mean, he was just a very cruel man. No doubt under the influence of the wicked one. And now in front of his friends, he's embarrassed because his wife says no. And listen again, ladies, I'm just going to tell you, you don't have to obey anything that's ungodly. You, you can simply say to your husband, I love you. I know God commands me to submit to you. But I'm only to submit to you as you submit unto the Lord. If you ask me to do something that violates God's word, then I'm going to have to say no. And whatever it costs me, it costs me. But I'll have nothing to do with that. Amen? I'm going to tell you again, this is profound to me because she comes in to the view of history. We don't even know if this is her real name. Most scholars think it's a title because there's no vasty mentioned in any of the historical records. They think it's a title. We're not really sure what her name is. We know what the name of the mom of Artaxerxes is, and it's not the same. So this could be the same woman, because Artaxerxes will be born a few, few years later. So this woman defies the most powerful man on the planet at this time, because she will not compromise to become immoral. And because she says no, the weight of this answer cannot be overlooked. Because if she would have said yes, there would have been no Esther. If there had been no Esther, Haman would have had his way and there would be no Israel today. I wonder sometimes what's in the balance for our lives when we are tempted to say yes or no. I wonder how many times we're in that same place where we saying yes to something we should say no to would change the whole complexion of our future and people around us. Have you ever thought about that? 
When you're in the valley of decision, you're being tempted to compromise. I mean, I think about Jesus. Now, I know he would never do that, but he was tempted 40 days in the wilderness, and Satan offered him what he came for. Did you know that? He took him to a high pinnacle and said, see the world, all that you see, I'll give you. Just worship me. But he offered, listen, he offered him what he came to redeem without the cross. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall serve no other God but the true and living God. No is a very important answer to the things that are moral. And we need to learn to say it. Because you don't know how it's going to affect your future. We now have the privilege of reading the text here and looking back and saying, wow, if she would have said yes, what would have happened? This world would have looked quite different than it does today. But because she said no and she refused, listen, in God's providence... God working, God working in her heart to say no to these things and God's providence working behind the scenes. He is protecting Israel. He put it in her heart to say no. The king is wroth. She doesn't know she's going to be cut into pieces. She doesn't know what's going to happen. Listen to verse 13. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, the ideas, which knew the laws of the Medo-Persians. In fact, it was very interesting because it was said of Nebuchadnezzar when he ruled, he was actually a, a real dictator. Whatever he said went. He could change his mind and it went. He had ultimate power. But when we come down to the Medo-Persians, listen, they didn't have ultimate power. When a king made a decree, he couldn't take it back. And he was bound to the law of the Medo-Persians. And so now the king is saying to the wise men of his court, who knew the times, who knew the laws, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. He says, uh, and the next unto him, those are the people that are close to him. Now he's got these counselors, Karshana, Sithar, Admatha, Tarshish, Miris, Miratha, and listen to this one. Uh, me McCann. Me McCann, listen, this guy's going to be quite a stinker before we're done with our narrative. We'll get chapter one done. These were the seven princes of Persia and the Medes, which saw the king's face, which is not a good thing, and which sat first in the kingdom. To see the king's face when he's angry. It, it, have, you ever, have you ever gone to somebody's house and you've gone in the gate and all of a sudden there's a mean dog there? And this dog is growling, and he's throffing. You know what the worst thing you can do to a mean dog? Look it in the eyes. Because when you look that dog in the eyes, it's a challenge. It's to say, that's what he's saying. So they looked the king in the eyes. They probably should have looked down and said, man, this guy is mad. And then they, then they say this in verse 15. What shall we do unto Queen Vashti? according to the law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king. Xerxes, by the chambermaids. Listen to this Mimukan. Mimukan answered before the king and the princes, Vasti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in the provinces of the king Asherah. For she did for, for this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so they shall despise their husbands in their eyes. When they shall, shall hear of this report, when this is reported, the king Xerxes commanded Vashti the queen to be brought before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies and the Persians and the Medes say this day unto the kings and the princes, which have heard of this deed of the queen, thus shall they arise in much contempt and wrath. We're going to create a riot here with these women. We got to keep these women in their place. Bunch of drunken fools. Listen, they didn't know much about women, did they? So his advice was, he didn't, she didn't just sin against you, king. She sinned against the whole kingdom. Because she gave an example 
of being rebellious to her husband, the king. And this attitude will become predominant in the kingdom. And these women will rise up against their husbands. And it's going to be bad for all of us. Can you imagine when he went home? He's probably afraid of his wife when he went home. She said, hey, I heard you were the instigators. Oh, no, not me. I tried to talk him out of it. He's probably afraid of his wife is why he's saying these things. He's thinking in his mind, if you give my wife an inch at home, I don't know what her name is, it's not recorded in the scripture, you give my wife an inch and she'll think she's the ruler. We got to smack this thing down, man. We got to deal with, we're about to have an uprising here among the women and it's not going to go well for us. She didn't just sin against you, O king. She sinned against all of us. That's his advice. Drunken idiot. Verse 19, we'll just finish this up. If it please the king, let there be a royal command from him. Now, this guy knows that once he gives a royal command, he can't take it back. When he sobers up, he can't take it back. This is the law of the Medes and Persians. If it pleases the king, let there go out a royal command from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and of the Medes, that is to be not to be altered that Vashtis came no more before the king Arash, uh, Xerxes and, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Take away her credit cards, take away her Rolls Royce, take away her apartment, take away everything. Her wardrobe, give it to somebody else. Send her away. That was the decree. Listen to verse 20. And the king's decree, he... he this is, and when the king's decree, which is, which shall be make uh, pub, published throughout all the empire, for it is great, all the wise. When you send this decree out throughout all your empire, listen to what this guy says. All of the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to, both to those that are great and both to those that are small. It, listen, man, ladies, plug your ears for a moment. Man, when you ever try to impress your, uh, oppress your wives, how does it work? That's the guy that looks like he's been drugged through a knothole backwards. Listen. I won't even say it. Jason, you know better than that. Listen. <laughs> Boy, this is a tough one tonight. This is the introduction, too. We got, we got nine more chapters after this. Um, <laughs> listen, women respond to love. They don't respond to demands. We men are not to be dictators. And we're never to ask anything immoral of our wives. Um, Christ loved his church to the point where he's willing to die for us, his bride. And he's never put a demand on us that was ungodly. In fact, he laid down his life for us. And so th this guy has it all wrong. Again, he's a drunken idiot. What would you expect? He's set too long at wine. It's, it's marred his judgment. He says to the king, send out a decree, send it to all the provinces. And by the way, they had something not too unsimilar from our Pony Express in those days. In fact, I, I got to see it in Turkey. It was interesting. We were on these different roads and I kept seeing these like stations where there were like remains of like old corrals and stuff. And so I asked the tour guide, our, our tour guide, when we were in Turkey, I said, what are these things I'm seeing? Every? She goes, every 14 miles. This was the postal route. This was every 14 miles they had a stable. And so when they would send out a decree to the king, they would like pony stress ride for 14 miles. And then they would give it to somebody else, new horse, new rider, 14 miles. And literally they could, they could span this kingdom in just a couple of days. I marveled at the connectivity that this area had when I was in Turkey. It was amazing. But so he says, send out these riders and make this decree and then when that happens, then all the women will just fall in line and they'll honor the husbands, whether he be great or small. That's a man who does not understand women. That's a man who's a drunken idiot. Verse 21, and I get a, get a laugh over, that you, that's a fool there. Um, verse 21, and the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mirmachan. Uh, for he sent letters unto all the king's provinces into every providence according to the writing thereof. 
and to every people after their language, so the different languages got it in their language, listen carefully, that every man should bear rule in his own house. Uh, you know, we are called to do that as men. Did you know that? But not this way. Not this way. We lead by example. You know, Paul tells us of his own relationship with the Lord as part of the bride to the bridegroom. He said, it is the love of Christ that constrains me. You know, I, I don't serve the Lord because of law or of fear. No, I fear the Lord. But I don't serve him because I fear him. I serve him because I love him. I serve him because he first loved me. And he demonstrated that love to me by laying down his life for me to pay my debt. And, and the most compelling, listen, the most constraining force on this planet is love. It's what kept Jesus on the cross. It wasn't those spikes driven through his wrist and through his feet. He could have just uttered the words and 10,000 of his angels would have came and removed him from the cross. What kept him there was his love for you and me. What motivates my wife to, to be obedient to me is a couple of things. I just want to share that before we close this thing out. Number one, she knows I love her. Number two, she knows I have her best interest at heart. Number three, she knows I would never ask her to do anything that was wrong or immoral. And number four, she knows I'd lay down my life for her in a heartbeat. And because she knows that about me, then she's willing, as we study in the book of Ruth, to come under the skirt of my protection. It's never by force. They said of Jesus, never a man spake with such authority. The Pharisees speak with power. This man spoke with authority. We want to follow him. We're forced to follow the others. And if you have Christ in your heart as men, and you're full of the Holy Spirit, and you love God's word, women want to follow that. Amen? This is all wrong, and it's not going to turn out good. So every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the languages of every people. And so they send it out. When we pick up next week, four years will have gone by between chapter 1 and chapter 2. We're going to see that the king has finally cooled down. Here's the point I want you to, to take home, and we'll pick this up next week. It took him four years to calm down because his pride was wounded. And then he'll get lonely, and he'll seek another queen, and that's what we'll pick up next week. But listen, the, the, the takeaway in chapter 1 is very important. The takeaway in chapter 1 is it cries out to us. You have no idea the decisions you're making are determining your future and the future of a lot of people around you. You have no idea. We would have never known. This book would have never been written if she would have said, yes, I'll come in and remove my veil. Esther would have never come to the fore. Haman would have had his way. And again, like I said, Israel would be a distant memory. But the providence of God, working behind the scenes, putting it in this queen's heart not to compromise, putting that conviction in her heart that this is wrong, this isn't immoral, and no matter what it costs me, I'm not saying yes to this. I'm going to say no, and it will cost her. It'll cost her dearly but because she was unwilling to compromise. I hold this woman in high regard. I hope she's in heaven when we get there. I'd like to spend some time. I've got a whole list of people I like to spend time talking to. But I like to spend, because she, listen, this was the most wicked and feared man on the planet she said no to. It wasn't a light thing not to compromise. And she said no. And it did cost her everything. I think she will be highly rewarded in heaven. The 
takeaway from chapter 1 is learn to say no to the things that are wrong. Because you have no idea the effect, the ripple effect it will have. Amen? So the stage is set. All these drunken noblemen and princes are there for 180 days at this drunken feast, planning war against uh, uh, Leonidas. And, uh, we'll, we, you know, we know from history how that worked out. Um, but we know that it incited the whole Greek empire. And what Daniel saw in his vision is now in transition. It's transitioning from the Medo-Persians to the Greek empire. But the lesson we're going to learn as we go through these next nine chapters is incredible. You don't want to miss. Well, let's stand and let's pray. Let's see. I think I've used them. I, if you guys will help me, I'll close out in the last song so Pastor Todd doesn't have to come up in the worship team. But let's pray. Father, we thank you. How many times a day are we challenged by the wicked one to compromise? How many times a day are we challenged to say yes to the things that we should be saying no to and no to the things we should be saying yes to? Lord, help us always to have the right answer. And anything that's immoral, anything that's not of you, Father, no matter what it costs us, God, give us the courage and the strength to say no to it because we have no idea. We have no idea how it's going to affect our future and the future of a lot of other people. So, Lord, help us to be men and women of integrity, men and women who, no matter what it costs, can say no to the things we should say no to. May that be our takeaway tonight, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And again, all God's kids would say,